The origins of Bitcoin is one of the craziest stories I have ever heard. If I was selling Bitcoin, I would I would speak about history. There's crime, suspense, drugs, romance. Well, not not really romance, but lots of love for easy, quick money. Bitcoin bouncing back. Bitcoin. 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 Sweet little bitcoins in Ethereum. So buckle up. The story begins at a coffee shop in Austin, Texas in 2011. Ross William Ulbrich sits at a coffee shop in downtown Austin. He's typing away, coding for a website he's working on. He wants to build something like eBay, with the small difference that instead of buying used goods or computer parts, in Ulbrich's website, people will be able to buy anything from marijuana to opioids to AR-15. And the site will be called Silk Road. Ulrich rented a cabin outside of Austin, which he used to grow mushrooms. Yeah, the magic kind. One day, he's drinking coffee and working on his website, and he gets a phone call from his landlord. Turns out he drove by the cabin, he went inside, now he knows what Ulrich is using the cabin for. So the landlord tells him that he's got one hour to enter his cabin, otherwise he's calling the cops. Given the circumstances, that's actually kind of nice of him. Ross bolts out of the coffee shop and heads toward the cabin. He barely makes it there, tosses all the magic fungi in a couple of big trash bags and drives off. He narrowly makes it out before the cops arrive. But he's out and he's got all his magic little tiny trees with him. In January 2009, computer programmer Hal Finney received an email from Satoshi Nakamoto. Finney and Nakamoto had made contact initially a year ago on an online forum for programmers interested in virtual currencies. The email contained a program that Nakamoto wrote that allows users to mine what we all know now as bitcoins. With Finney's encouragement, a few days later Nakamoto released the program to the public online, officially launching bitcoin into the world. In 2010, Jed McCaleb built a site called Mount Gods, making it easier for users to purchase bitcoin with dollars. I know there's a lot of different characters in this story, but trust me, it's worth following along. So Mount Gox pretty much connected people who sold Bitcoin with those who wanted to buy. A very simple idea, but at the time, they were the first ones doing it. The website grows quickly. In one month after launching, $1,000 worth of Bitcoin is exchanged on Mount Gox every day. The number of users continues to grow, but at this point, the real value of Bitcoin is pretty much zero. A year later in 2011, Ross Ulbricht's plans to sell drugs online using his website Silk Road had one little problem. If he were to use something like PayPal to get a cut of every transaction that happens on Silk Road, once he receives a payment using PayPal, that could be easily be tracked back to him, leaving him vulnerable to law enforcement and likely to serve hardcore jail time. But Ulbricht is no fool, at least not at this point. He is planning to charge his operational fees using, you guessed it, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is designed to leave no trails. The data used in any transaction made with Bitcoin is 100% encrypted and there's no need for banks until you actually need to convert the digital coins into actual dollars. So there's no way all illegal sales conducted on Silk Road can be traced back to him. And that's exactly what Ross Ulbricht needs. In January 2011, Ulbricht launched Silk Road. He promoted the site on various chat rooms dedicated to Bitcoin. He even offered guidance and tutorials on how to buy. You can you cannot make this shit up. He even offered guidance and tutorials on how to buy drugs on his site, pay with Bitcoin, and get it delivered right to your front door. Kind of like Amazon Prime, but for drugs. People are getting drugs delivered to their homes and nobody's getting caught. This makes the site grow in popularity. Silk Road now sells anything from homegrown marijuana to herring and other opioids. The more Silk Road grows, the more money Ulbrich makes. Business is good. All this early success of Silk Road and Bitcoin catches the attention of Roger Veer. I know, another character, this is kind of like Game of Thrones. Roger Veer identifies as a libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, a peace advocate, and advocate for individualism. 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 He made some money in the late 90s and early 2000s in Silicon Valley, actually quite a lot of money, and he also got into some trouble with the US government, allegedly because of his political views. He even renounced his US citizenship in 2014, but that's not really important right now. Veer believes that if Bitcoin succeeds, governments will be helpless and his dreams of a libertarian society will finally come true. So he goes 100% into Bitcoin. He invests a big part of his fortune in it, he buys ads, promoted Bitcoin, and his businesses actually start to accept Bitcoin to pay for their services and goods. He's so committed to the idea of a decentralized currency that he gets the nickname Bitcoin Jesus.
It seems like by now everything in the world of Bitcoin and our story's protagonists is going fabulous. Fabulous. Except that is not. In June of 2011, hackers got a hold of Mt. Gox Auditor's computer and changed the price of Bitcoin to one cent. Then they started buying Bitcoin at this artificial price, obtaining about 2,000 Bitcoin. This would be only the beginning of Mt. Gox's troubles with hackers. Later on, Mt. Gox took a ginormous hit in the largest Bitcoin hack to date. Hackers stole 740,000 Bitcoin from Mt. Gox customers and 100,000 from the company itself. Roughly the equivalent of 460 million at the time. After the first time Mt. Gox got hacked, Roger V realized that the future of Bitcoin cannot rely only on one company. So he started looking for other startups to fund which meant that if one startup fails, that will not mean Bitcoin itself would fail. Roger is right, but by now, he's not the only one who's got his sights on Bitcoin, and the competition to find and fund the next big startup in Bitcoin will be fierce. Charles Schramm IV is an American entrepreneur and Bitcoin advocate. He co-founded the Bitcoin startup company BitInstant. Initially a side project, BitInstant soon needed to grow. Shortly thereafter, BitInstant received $125,000 from Roger Veer. And in the fall of 2012, $1.5 million from a group of investors led by Winklevoss Capital Management. If the name sounds familiar to you, it's because these two guys are the Winklevoss brothers. The two dudes from the Facebook movie. So you may ask yourself, how did the Winklevoss get involved with SRAM and BitInstant and Bitcoin? Well, let me tell you. After being rejected from numerous possible investments in Silicon Valley, no one really wanted to piss off Mark Zuckerberg by doing business with the twins. The Winklevoss were drowning their sorrows partying in Ibiza. Could be worse, right? Ibiza sounds like a lovely place to feel miserable about yourself. At a party in Ibiza, the brothers are approached and told about Shrem, his company, and Bitcoin. The brothers were hesitant at first, they didn't even know what Bitcoin was. But they were desperate to find investment opportunities outside of Silicon Valley, and the idea of Bitcoin sounded enticing enough to make him want to meet Shrem back in Brooklyn. After a convincing and successful meeting with Shrem, the twins invested $800,000 for a 22% ownership in BitInstant. By they not only invested in the company, they also started buying Bitcoins. However, the brothers were so concerned about their Bitcoins being hacked that they printed out all the necessary documents and then they destroyed all the electronic devices they used to purchase Bitcoin, even the printers. At this point in the crypto world, lots of new players have their sights on Bitcoin. So here's where I introduce you to two new characters, Brian Armstrong and Fred Erson. I'm telling you, GOT has nothing on the Bitcoin story. Crazy, crazy stuff. In 2012, Armstrong and Fred Ersam co-founded Coinbase as a way for cryptocurrency enthusiasts to trade Bitcoins and other digital currencies. In 2013, the economy of the country of Cyprus collapsed, forcing its citizens to find different alternatives to save their money and not to lose it all to inflation. The people from Cyprus also wanted to stash their money in Bitcoin so the government could not touch it. This brings the demand for Bitcoin through the roof, making the value of all Bitcoin more than $1 billion for the first time in Bitcoin history. At this time, Coinbase is growing exponentially, but BitInstant is still ahead. Charlie Schramm, the founder and CEO of BitInstant, is on top of the world widely recognized as the most important name in the crypto world and even becoming somewhat of a Bitcoin celebrity, making multiple public speaking appearances to educate people about cryptocurrencies. Unfortunately for Shrem and BitInstant, the reality behind the scenes was not as good as it seemed to be. By now, the Winklevoss twins are not super thrilled on how Charlie Shrem behaves in public and how he runs BitInstant. They also have a big problem with Charlie's relationship with Roger Veer who in their minds is a criminal who should not have anything to do with their company. Things got so bad that the Winklevoss threatened Shrem with pulling their funding if he didn't get his act together. In July 2013, BitInstant was not able to secure a license to transfer money, although they had publicly claimed that they did have such license in New York State. They lied. Yeah, they lied. Shrem initially refused the advice of his lawyer to shut down the site until they were able to secure a license. However, 
scared of having to go to jail. A week later, Shrem takes down the site. Although he promises Beat Instant will come back, it never really does. Things ended up so bad that in 2018, the Winklevoss brothers sued Shrem for over 32 million. They claim Shrem owed them in Bitcoin. It's a lot of money. 2013 was definitely not a good year for crypto startups. Beat Instant was shut down for good. Coinbase got hacked, losing more than 250,000 in Bitcoin. And Ross Ulbrich, remember Ulbrich? He finds himself arrested by the FBI. During the arrest, his laptop is seized, providing law enforcement with a world of contacts and leads the police were about to go after. By now, Bit Instant is officially dead, but Charlie Shrem is still in high demand for public appearances and public speaking at crypto conferences. In January of 2014, Charlie was coming back into the US where after presenting his passport to the immigration officer, he was asked to step aside and wait. After a few minutes, multiple FBI agents entered the room and arrested him. They charged him with money laundering, operating an unlicensed money transmitting business, and failing to file suspicious activity reports. Around the same time, the FBI also arrested Robert M. Fails, who was a Bitcoin broker also known as BTC King. The DEA, IRS, and the Manhattan U.S. Attorney's Office stated that the pair were instrumental in selling about one million worth of Bitcoin to Silk Road users, which according to the complaint, was used to buy and sell drugs. Shrem got a two-year sentence. Two years? That's not that bad. This story is nuts, but we're not quite done yet. In part two of the crazy story behind Bitcoin, the Winklevoss make a strong return to the cryptocurrency world, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook enter the crypto arena, and the newest and hottest cryptocurrency promises to change the financial world forever. If you enjoyed this video and don't want to miss part two, please make sure you like and subscribe. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you guys on the next one.